uh, no slides, no equations, just simple questions. Uh, and I want to sort of change the discussion for a couple of minutes, right? I only have 15, so uh, that's about as much as, as, as those of us who ask these questions ever get. Uh, from moving, we've been talking a lot, we've been hearing a lot about what we can do and how we can do these things. And I want to change the question slightly and start talking about what we should do and how we should do it. Because as we start rolling out the Internet of Things, and this is at least the third time we've been rolling out the Internet of Things, and each time, by the way, we roll out more and more of it, what we are doing is instrumenting the world at a greater and greater density to get more and more data that allows us to do very interesting things. And some of those interesting things are morally neutral, but others of those interesting things make you sort of go, hmm. As we saw earlier when they were saying, well, you know, not only do I want to come and repair your um, water tank at 9 o'clock because I know it's going to fail, but I also know that you're up there on your second cup of coffee and, oh, by the way, you shouldn't have had that third glass of wine last night. <laughs> and we've told your doctor and your insurance agency. <laughs> you laugh, but this is the kind of world that we are looking at as we instrument in this way. The kind of data that we get is giving us a rich field for doing all kinds of science, including the social and psychological sciences, where the subjects of the science that we are doing are human beings to which we have a moral obligation. And if we do not think about how we approach these problems, how we do this work, how we deploy this technology, we are opening up not only very interesting uses, but very troubling abuses of both the technology and the data that we gather. And this is not simply a technological question. We can always say, look, of course we can use all of this data. We'll simply de-identify it. And this is a marvelous indication that the person who has made this suggestion has never worked on de-identification of data. It's really hard to de-identify data in such a way that it can't be re-identified. I teach a class in privacy. We turn out about 36 undergraduates a year who take it as a challenge to re-identify data sets that have been thoroughly de-identified. And furthermore, there is very good evidence that as you de-identify to various levels of de-identification, you introduce statistical bias into the data so that as you get more and more privacy entered into your data sets, you get less and less accuracy to the point that your conclusions will be, to use the technical term, wrong. And I find it very troubling to be in a position where you have to choose between privacy and science. Now, we may not have to. People are beginning to study more ways, uh, more imaginative ways of doing de-identification or also more imaginative ways of defining privacy where we may not have to make this trade-off. But it is not a simple thing. Now, the point on all of this is as we build the technologies that are used to deploy the Internet of Things, we as technologists need to think about the implications of our design. Because whether we like it or not, we are creating policy decisions in the work that we do. Larry Lessig told us more than a decade ago that code is a form of law. That the computer code that we write actually will embody rules of interaction and behavior that are, once deployed, very, very hard to change. Right? The, the discussions about network neutrality that were held this, the last couple of years were sort of charming for anybody who really knows how the internet works because at its base, because of the end-to-end -end principle that was an early design decision in the internet, the internet is effectively neutral in terms of the content. 
but the policymakers didn't know this. Now, of course, there are companies that would like to charge in spite of this, and that's different than actual neutrality. But the power of the network was embodied in the code that created a rule that said the network will be neutral. That was a decision that was made by technologists. That was a decision that had implications. They've been very positive implications, fortunately. But was the decision made knowing the policy implications that it would have? Now, knowing some of the people that worked on the end-to-end -end paper, I think, yes, it was. But are you, as deployers of the Internet of Things, actually thinking about the ethical and moral implications of the data that could be gathered from the things that you are deploying? And if you aren't, who is? The usual response that I hear from way too many students is, oh, yeah, I'm a simple engineer. I don't do this kind of thing. That's for policymakers to do. But policymakers are somewhere between three and 20 years behind what we are doing. By the time policy is discussed, we're deploying the third generation. And the, the fact on the ground overrides the policy that is discussed. So whether you like it or not, you as deployers of this technology are making policy decisions as you move forward. What should those decisions be? How much data do you gather and record? The usual response from engineers is, let's gather all of it. You never can tell when it might be useful, and I might need it. And hell, storage is cheap. But that has implications. That means that when the FBI comes to you with a warrant, you have that data. Have you thought of that? Have you actually, if you are deploying an Internet of Things, have you run the tabletop exercise that is your response to a subpoena? And have you thought about your customers in that? Have you thought about what that would do to your business? If you haven't, I suggest you think about doing that. It's not a bad idea. Have you thought about what you process locally and what you send over the wire? It's the same set of questions that you should be looking at. It's the same notion of whether when a machine is doing something with the data, that's very different than when a human being looks at the data. Where do you draw that line? How do you protect from abuse by employees, by leakage from people who are trying to get into your network? These are not things that you can wait for the third iteration that you can add in later, that you can worry about after you've done the minimum viable product. Because the minimum viable product is not viable if it is a product that has ethical implications that you do not wish to have. You know, Michael Sandel, in his justice class, spends an entire day, sometimes multiple days, talking about the trolley problem. You all know about the trolley problem? Yeah. Trolley problem, you know, the trolley's barreling down the track. You've got the lever. Uh, there's, you know, th a, a woman with a baby carriage on one track. There are three convicts who did terrible crimes on the other track. You have to pick one. What do you do? And then you start changing this, uh, the, the example as to see what the ethics of what you are doing is, is going to be, what your intuitions are. This was actually first uh, proposed by Philip Afoot. Other philosophers have worked on this for years and years. It's a very entertaining sort of thing. And you wonder, what the hell is he talking about this for? The reason I'm talking about this is somewhere in Silicon Valley, maybe right now, there is a programmer working on autonomous vehicles who is making that decision algorithmically, whether the programmer knows it or not. The trolley problem that we can't actually decide on in our philosophical discussions is being decided on in a product that will ship. 
And that's an ethical decision that somebody is making. Now, you're not building autonomous vehicles. You're just doing Internet of Things. So you have a much simpler set of problems. <laughs> Except it all connects together. Because after all, if I, was the, if I was that engineer, I would be putting this off by saying, well, once I've got the Internet of Things, I can actually go out, find the medical records, see what the expected life expectancy is, check their, uh, check their bank accounts if I'm a Republican, you know, this sort of thing. <laughs> to make a weighted decision in this way. But we don't have that luxury. What I'm trying to point out to you is the simple fact that as you design these things, you are making policy decisions. You need to engage with people who think about this if you don't. You need to be able to justify the decisions you make, if not to others, at least to yourself. And the privacy of the people who are going to be using the products that you make is something you have to take into account as you collect and aggregate and come to conclusions based on the data that you are collecting. The Internet of Things might be one of the great ways for us to drive efficiencies in energy, in the way we live, in all sorts of things, safety, who knows. But it's also the deployment of the most sophisticated surveillance state you could ever imagine. So which is it going to be? You as deployers can determine this policy. You as deployers will determine this policy. But you better think about it, because this is not a policy that should happen by happenstance. It should, be, it should happen by thought and by reflection. And you should be able to say why it is the way it is. And with those simple questions and no equations, I will ask if there are any questions from the audience. So let me see if I can rephrase your statement in the form of a question. Um, so uh, I, I said that we have that policy lags behind. Yet in the European Union, there are already privacy policies that dictate, for example, that in machine learning, there be a certain amount of transparency in the algorithm so that you can understand what the algorithm is doing. Well, so. Certainly, the European Union is far more aggressive in terms of privacy policy than the United States, uh, which, by the way, has economic implications. Uh, I would claim that Facebook could have never happened in the European Union because of all of the various privacy commissioners that would have to sign on who would not. Um, hmm? Well, that may not be a bad thing, but he's, he's donating, so we don't ask. Um, there, there are other cases as well. But, so this is part of the trade-off that we have to decide, is how do we trade off between the sort of rapid innovation and the ability to have this sort of protection. The European Union can be, in some ways, a good example, because it does really worry about privacy. There are other rather absurdist things that they do. The right to be forgotten, well, you know, we should, if, if I had the right to be forgotten, I wouldn't be the local ethicist. Um, but it's, 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 it's a hard question on this. Part of the problem is that the policymakers do not understand the technology. They, they have experts on machine learning at the, at the, at the policy level. So why, if do we here? Have you watched the current discussion about <laughs> IANA? Uh, and by the way, they don't always there either. So I, I think one of the reasons Europe looks so much more advanced is because they're further away. Because um, they've made pl plenty of interesting, yes, interesting, I'll put it that way. 
uh, interesting decisions in this area. There is this interplay. It's beginning to happen. I am urging you to make it happen more often. David. Uh, so maybe to follow up on this, I mean, I think this is a good example of where policy goes wrong because the idea that you can um, expect an AI to explain a decision, we all know these are, these are multifaceted, modular, algorithmic systems using data, making lots of inference. You can't expect to be able to explain that. And I, I, I would worry if I was living in Europe that they really, uh, they really constrained the innovation that will be possible. So my question is... Okay. Oh, whew. good. Good question. Are there, are there, are there examples of uh, technological things that we can do where, where we are willing to somehow put the technology in some kind of box that will enable policy, that would enable more transparency, but somehow doesn't hamper it too much? I guess you cited the end-to-end -end principle. Are there, are there other examples where, 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 where there isn't the tension between the ability to to innovate and the need for policymakers to protect the citizens of their country? Well, so uh, the question I believe, I, uh, since I was asked to uh, repeat the question, is are there examples of places where policymakers and technologists have actually been able to work together in a way that does not constrain the innovation, but allows this kind of discussion? I think we're seeing some of this in the self-driving cars where there is a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of questioning going on, people are very much involved in the two, there's a lot of explaining of what can happen and what cannot happen. Uh, we will see how well that works out. We certainly saw a lot of this in the development of nuclear technologies, but that was generally different because the innovation, thank goodness, was not quite as fast, and it was more controlled and a much smaller uh, set of people who were doing it. I, I do not think this is an easy problem, how you get this stuff together. Uh, what, I, what I do hope is that at least the people in this room will not take the attitude, oh, oh I'm just an engineer, I don't have to think about these things. Because it is incumbent on us to think about these things. This is one of the advantages, by the way, of a liberal arts education, as opposed to the Votec down the river, is that we train people in these kinds of things. Sorry, was that on, was that on tape? Uh, one last, yes. again this year for Hack Harvard, mm -hmm. and I've even talked to David Mellon about, for CS50, about the issues, you know, going to being humbled when I went to an accessibility conference, not knowing because, like, I don't have a problem, I have eyes here, I don't have to think about it, it's not my problem, but I'm in education. The issues of security, and as you say, with all the hacking going on, I was taught, as when I taught CS and MIT, I wasn't taught how to write secure code. I mean, it was not, you know, you just make something. And now, uh, when I'm mentoring students, I want to say start before they start their professional careers, while they're going through their training, because, you know, course six CS is huge at MIT and certain C's at Harvard, start them to thinking about this at the design level. Like, just bake it yep. in that it's, like you said, it's not an afterthought. Like, oh, we'll do it, but it's too much money for security slash, you know, the Yahoo kind of mm. version of like, yeah, yeah, it just costs too much. Just think about, so that they can think about, yes, we need to make money, and that can be the competitive advantage that they are transparent and that they are reasonably secure and that they are accessible. So. And that was a statement and not a question, so I can't repeat it, but I agree with it wholeheartedly. <laughs> part of this starts with education. Part of this starts with the apprenticeship that they go through when they get out in, on the job. Yep. That part of design has to be security, yep. part of the design has to be reliability, but part of the design also has to be thinking about the implications of both the use and abuse of the technology that you are putting forward. And at least understanding, as in all of engineering, it's trade-offs. There, no, there is no black and white here, mm -hmm. but there are trade-offs that you have to make, and it's much better to make those trade-offs consciously than just let them happen. And I'm being shushed up, so thank you. <laughs>